Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events today. And I'm really delighted to, uh, to welcome John Mullen to the program today. We're gonna be talking about his wonderful new book, The Artful Dickens, uh, The Tricks and Ploys of the Great Novelist. And um, uh, Kate Moss, the, no the wonderful novelist, Kate Moss, um, who was supposed to be joining us today, unfortunately, she had a bit of an emergency and so she's not able to join us. But uh, it's funny, amusingly, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had originally scheduled this and due to some sort of, you know, whatever happened, John didn't get the memo on that. And, uh, but Barbara and Kate had a nice little conversation <laughs> in your absence uh, about the book, which we recorded and, and viewers can go back and kind of watch that at the same time. Well, well look, I, can I go back and watch it sometime? I'd, back, be yeah. I'd be fascinated. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me just give you the, the formal introduction that you deserve. Um, let's see, John Mullen is Lord Nord Northcliffe Professor of Modern English Literature at University College London. He's published extensively on 18th and 19th century literature. He's also a prolific broadcaster and journalist and writes on contemporary fiction for The Guardian. In 2009, he was one of the judges for the Man Booker Prize. Uh, did they send you just hundreds of novels that you had to wade through for that? 134. Blimey. Uh, he's lectured widely on both uh, Jane Austen and Dickens in the UK and the US. Uh, his, his most recent book is What Matters in Jane Austen. He lives in London. Uh, well, welcome, John. It's great to ha have you. Thanks, Patrick. And I'm really sorry about two weeks ago. That ah. was a cock up corner. These things happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just to get into uh, this, this wonderful book, you know, reading it, it struck me, we were talking a little bit before we got started, um, just about, I found it to be a real revelation reading reading it and, and just to kind of learn, even though I've, you know, like a lot of people watching, you know, knew a little bit uh, about Dickens, not a lot, but the basics, uh, just to realize how many of the conventions and templates and literary devices that uh, we talk about all the time here at the bookstore with authors. You know, Dickens just flat out invented. Um, can you talk, and, and these, these tricks and ploys and this yes. wonderful uh, improvisatory thing that he had that maybe a lot of people don't realize yeah yeah i'm sure i mean you mentioned at the beginning that i actually once upon a time i did, was a judge for the man booker prize and that i i i write for newspapers sometimes about about contemporary fiction and um i mean one thing that slightly got me going on this book was how i started noticing um that some of these kind of devices that literary novelists use nowadays, and that maybe people sort of think were sort of invented in the 1960s, say, um, or maybe they were invented by James Joyce in the 1920s, or maybe they were, you know, or maybe they were invented by Henry James in the 1890s. But actually, <laughs> how Dickens was, as it were, not getting his, his due. And that, um, that this was something to do with the way that we were all taught to see Dickens and researching the book, I think the way that people saw him from the word go, that he's an entertainer. You know, he's a great entertainer. He does these wonderful characters. And as, as, as you know, rival novelists have always said as if it's an easy thing. Oh yeah, I admit he's funny. He's quite funny as well. He's funny <laughs> as if that's easy, but, but, but actually, very rarely have people sort of pointed out um, his sort of formal ingenuity. I mean, just to give you one little example of the kind of things I'm talking about, um, and you, you, you kindly read, read my book, so you know about it, but, but um, you know, round about, round about the 1960s, uh, British and American novelists started experimenting in writing novels in the present tense, okay? And this was kind of a really kind of cool and experimental thing to do. And, and it started off in France with the Nouveau Roman, then people like Muriel Spark took it up and, and, then, and, then, and, and, and then you go on and Don DeLillo does it and, and, and um, 
you know, Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell trilogy, which famously won the Man Booker Prize twice in Britain, is all in the present tense. Um, but actually, Dickens did this. Dickens did this, strangely enough, you know, right back in the 1850s, in, in, in a, in, and first of all, really thoroughly in, in Bleak House, which is kind of divided up between chapters in the present tense and chapters in the past tense. And the chapters in the present tense are told in the, in the third person, um, impersonally, as it were, and the chapters in the past tense are told in the first person by the novel's heroine, Esther. And these chapters are sort of interleaved. And if you did it, if somebody did it now, they'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got to put this on the Man Booker shortlist, haven't we? I mean, this is terrific, formal playfulness. But the extraordinary thing is that when it was published in, in the 1850s, and it was a bestseller, Bleak House did very, very well, um, I've looked at all the responses and reviews. Nobody mentions it. Nobody mentions this most extraordinary thing about the novel. And, and um, people say, oh, you know, here's some more great, wonderful gargoyle characters from Mr. Dickens. I but nobody, nobody notices the sort of literary ingenuity. So, I mean, that's just one example. And I've tried to find lots of examples, but, but that's the kind of thing that prompted me to, to, to write the book, to try and see the writer that we, we thought we know so well in a kind of slightly different way. Well, it's, it's interesting you should say that. And since I'm always aware when I'm, give, when I'm doing these, these programs of not giving spoilers, but this isn't that kind of book because you, it's, you can dip in and dip out. And uh, so I'm just gonna go to the very end of the book. Right. When you talk about his, the, perhaps his greatest trick of all, which is uh, the repetitiousness Yes, and, and, and the sentence rhythm. You mentioned James Joyce a few minutes ago. You quote this wonderful passage. I, I believe it was from Great Expectations. Yes, um, which is meant, you know, as as you emphasize, it's meant to be read aloud. And I thought of James Joyce. I thought of you know being lost in Ulysses somewhere, with all of those like fifteen ands. Yeah. Can I? Could I? Could I give share it with your with, the, be with the viewers? Because yeah. I have actually. Now this is a real test, isn't it, of my of my competence? But I think that I can do this because I think I've got the very passage which you're right. It's right at the end of the book, yeah. Um, and it's kind of one of my favourite passages, but it's very characteristic. So I'm gonna I'm going to do this now. And uh, can you go. see that, Patrick? I can, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. And then people should be able to see that. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read it out loud. Please. Because, of course, Dickens wrote to be read out loud. You know, this is one of the things about him. And what you're saying just now is, is a kind of reflection of the fact that, you know, that, that he wrote for the voice as much as for the eye, really. Um, and so what's happening now, it's quite important to sort of know, so this is in a later part of the novel, chapter 54, and, and Pip, the narrator, has been revisited by Magwitch, the escaped convict whom we met so memorably in the very first chapter of the novel. And, and it's a horrific re-meeting for the, for the now adult, young adult Pip, because he thought that his fortune was left to him by Miss Havisham, but spoiler alert, <laughs> he discovers that it actually comes from the, from the convict who's gone to Australia and made money farming. And so he's still got the taint of crime upon him, Pip feels. Anyway, Magwitch has to be smuggled out of the country because a transported convict was not allowed to return. And it, 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 it was a capital offence to return. So his life is in danger. And they, they want to put him on a ship, but they can't put him on a boat on the Thames because all the, key, the wharves are being watched. So they decide, Pip and his friends, they're going to row him down the Thames and intercept the packet, the packet boat, which is going to Hamburg, and put him on board. So they row down, Pip, his friend Herbert Pocket, and another friend called Startop, they row down out of London and into, this, into the estuary. And here it's, it's completely deserted. It was like my own marsh country, flat and monotonous, 
and with a dim horizon, while the winding river turned and turned, and the great floating buoys upon it turned and turned, and everything else seemed stranded and still. For now the last of the fleet of ships was round the last low point we had headed, and the last green barge straw laden with a brown sail had followed, and some ballast lighters, shaped like a child's first rude imitation of a boat, lay low in the mud, and a little squat shoal lighthouse on open piles stood crippled in the mud on stilts and crutches, and slimy stakes stuck out of the mud, and slimy stones stuck out of the mud, and red landmarks and tide marks stuck out of the mud, and an old landing stage and an old roofless building slipped into the mud, and all about us was stagnation and mud. <laughs> I think you're right. I think James Joyce would have been would have been proud of it. Or and, James, and it, James Heaney, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, wonderful. All those, I remember being told um, when I was being taught to write when I was sort of six or seven years old, don't never use more than one and in a sentence, you know. <laughs> yeah, all those muds, you know. It's just, all those muds it's just and all those sticky, yeah. stuck out of and stuck out of. And it's kind of incantatory. And, and I guess... The one thing I'd add to what you summed it up very well, but one thing I would add is that it's not just kind of fine writing for its own sake. Um, it, it has a point because the point is that Pip, at, it's a novel, Great Expectations, all about a character who thinks he's sort of surging into the future, making his destiny, and he's all the time being sucked back into the past. And when I look at this passage, I sometimes wonder if F. Scott Fitzgerald knew, was thinking, had this unconsciously in his mind when he wrote that amazing ending to The Great Gatsby, because it's about being sucked back into the past. So down on the Thames estuary, Pip is taken back to his own marsh country. So even the child's first rude imitation of a boat, it's appropriate because he's entering a kind of reverie. And you enter the reverie with him, don't you, when you read it or when you hear it read. And in a way, it's doing in just one little bit what the whole story does to Pip, which is to tell him that actually the past matters more than the future to him. So I'm going to pretty, stop it. Now. Pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and then you know, in, in the forward to the book, which is is really well done and sets up the uh, sets up the book very nicely. You know, you talk about um, I just wrote it down. His special mix of unliterariness and formal daring. Can you can you <laughs> kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I suppose it's exemplified in what we've just looked at. That that Dickens was a great one, I think, for making creative virtues out of necessities. And he, he even made a creative virtue out of the fact that he was, he was a kind of self-made writer. Mm. So, you know, he had very, very little schooling, um, a, little bit of, a little bit of a sort of dame school when he was tiny to teach him maybe to read and write. But he, after that, he only had two years in school, the Wellington House Academy, whose headmaster, he said, characteristically was quite the most ignorant man it has ever been my pleasure to meet <laughs> <laughs> and so Dickens was a kind of self-created autodidact writer. yeah an autodidact who learned lots of Shakespeare from first of all from his father who is this Mr. Micawber type figure who was very grandiloquent and used to sort of make speeches at supper to compensate for the fact that he hadn't got enough money to buy the food you know and and he also learned from going to the theatre you know he Dickens was addicted to the theatre he was addicted to Shakespeare um, but also melodrama and farce and all that stuff and I think that it meant that you know, nobody told him how to write polite English. And it meant that he could make it up for himself. And luckily for us, for posterity, he had not just the brilliance, but the self-confidence, incredible self-confidence to do that. So that passage we've just looked at, you know, there are 
there are other great novelists in the 19th century, but none of them would have, could have, would have written that. George Eliot wouldn't have written that. Henry James wouldn't have written that. Um, all those ands, all those stuck out of, stuck out of, and all that mud. No, they wouldn't have done that. And over and over again, you find things in Dickens that have a daring that only the self-made uh, writer could have, could have managed. You know, some of some of the people listening to this might know, might know his most famous of short, shorter fiction, uh, A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. You know, which starts. Have a look at the beginning of it. I'm just, it's really um, outrageous. It's got my favourite colon in English literature in it. So the first sentence is, Marley was dead. Colon, to begin with. <laughs> it's a great sort of joke in the beginning sentence. And to begin with is the thing somebody says at the beginning of a story they're telling you. But of course it also means he's about to come back to life. He's dead to begin with. He's not gonna be dead much longer. And then he says, yes, everybody knows he was dead, 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 dead. Dead as a doornail. Dead as, you know, <laughs> but lesson two after not using too many ands when I was a kid was, don't use cliches. Dickens, of course, loves a cliche. I and mean, when he starts in the second paragraph unpacking it, why should a doornail be thought to be dead? I, I think it should be a coffin nail. Isn't a coffin nail more dead than a doornail? But still, everybody says dead as a doornail, so I better go on saying dead as a doornail. I say emphatically, Marley was dead as a doornail. <laughs> and it's very, very conscious use of cliches. Very conscious and also very clever. Because Playful. what is a cliche but a dead bit of language? And what is this story about? It's a story about the dead coming back to life. And he even brings dead words back and dead phrases back to life. And I think that's a, another example of what you, what, what you were talking about, Patrick, the, the fact that he is this, you know, um, rule-breaking, self-created, jumped-up nobody of a writer. And do you think, I mean, I think I know, I know what you're going to say, but um, for everybody watching, a lot of this, a lot of these sort of revelations about him perhaps have been eclipsed because of his popularity. And, you know, he was a very commercial writer, um, you know, perhaps of his time, he was a best-selling commercial, uh, you know, writer. And as most people know, he published serially. Um, and can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, about how he wrote to the demands of serialization, you know, yeah. and, and everything, you know, by necessity would have had a very episodic feel to it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and like you say, he was, he was uh, the best-selling novelist of his age, not just in, not just in Britain, but, you know, in America as well. Um, although he was very cross, he didn't get most of the money from his sales in America um, and throughout Europe. You know, he was the most famous writer in the world, at, at, you know, by, by the middle of his career, but also the one who sold the most copies. And that was one of the reasons some of his contemporaries, even some of his friends, sort of were a bit snooty about him. You know, Mr. Popular Sentiment, Trollope called him. Um, but again, he did this extraordinary thing that he took this you, serialization. Yeah, in some ways, he invented it because he, he invented with Pickwick Papers, slightly by accident, this uh, form for fiction of monthly installments. OK, so all his novels, as I'm sure our, 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 our listeners know, all his novels were published, first of all, in serial form. But some were weekly and some were monthly. And the ones that were monthly, you got like a little paperback book, really, every month. And uh, except for his last novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drew, they were always in 20 parts. Um, so it's a good way of spreading the cost, but also maximizing the, for the purchaser, but maximizing the sales. And he developed an extraordinary ability to use the constraints of this form as, in kind of creative ways. Um, and I'm going to sh show one in a second. But so what he, if you think about it, um, I mean, usually now, if we watch TV serials are the best comparisons, 
and you watch it on something like Netflix and you can do it on demand. You can binge watch. As we, I don't know if you say that in the States, but we, we say binge, do. Yeah, binge watch. OK, so in in on British TV, the, the most popular, most watched TV serial of the last few years was a kind of basically a, a very complicated police procedural thing called Line of Duty. Very cleverly plotted, very and very cleverly scripted. And the big thing about it was that it was seven episodes, I think, the last series. And you couldn't, you had to watch them when they came out. Okay, it's Sunday night at nine o'clock. I mean, you could miss it and watch play again, but you couldn't watch it in advance. You had to wait. And so suddenly there were kind of 13 million people. Doesn't sound much in the States, but I mean, that's a lot. That's a quarter of the British yeah. population almost. Watch, you know, hanging on for every Sunday at nine. Right. And of course, you'd have the conventions at the beginning. You'd have a little recap, you know, the thing. Recap, yeah. Okay. Now imagine what Dickens had to do. His novels are really have really complicated plots. Some of them. He his readers had to wait for a month, and they had to do that nineteen times. And a month is quite a long time. And when he came back with the next instalment, he had to be able immediately to revive people's memories and so he discovered these amazing ways I think of doing it the way people talked so every one of his you know there's a chapter in my book about the way people talk every one of his characters and we all know there are a lot of them yeah have their sort of peculiar ways of talking and people's looks and gestures and the odd idiosyncratic things about them so that when we see them again or when we hear them again, we immediately get them and, and we get the, the associations that come with them. And he even, I'm going to, I'm just going to show an example, which I think is just a wonderful one from one of his weekly serials. It's Great Expectations again. He even used things like um, smells, right, to do this. So uh, I'm going to have a, see if I can do this. Okay. So, can you see that okay, Patrick? Yeah, no, it looks great. Okay, so, so this is Great Expectations, and uh, it's published weekly in his journal all the year round. So, he's editing the journal, so he's getting money from that, and the sales of the journal depend quite a lot on its lead novel, which is serialized every week. And... And I mean, it's a classic Dickens story. He had the, the, the sales of his journal were going down because the lead item, the, the novel, the serial novel written by a friend of his called Charles Lever just wasn't very good and people were losing interest. So he had this new novel he was planning, which was going to be a monthly serial, Great Expectations. And he said, no, no, right, I've got an emergency. I've got to repurpose it. And, but I mean, He's repurposing. He's only just started writing it because that's the other thing about serialization. He's only writing a few weeks or a couple of months ahead of, you know, the last installment. So he's really committed. He can't write the whole thing, get it all organized and then divide it up. He's got to see the end in the beginning. So this is just a little example. So this is Great Expectations. Pip's second visit to Miss Havisham's house. Many people will remember Miss Havisham's house and Pip is about and I put there uh the chapter but I've also put the date of the original installment right January the 12th 1861 and how old Pip is at the time he's aged eight and he encounters a man groping his way down a dark staircase of course Miss Havisham's house the light is shut out all the time and this man grabs him he grabs him by the throat and he's a frightening man. And we never get, we don't find out what he's called or anything. And he just says to Pip, boy of the neighborhood, well, behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys and you're a bad set of fellows. Now mind, said he, biting the side of his great forefinger as he frowned at me, you behave yourself. With those words, he released me 
which I was glad of, for his hand smelt of scented soap and went his way downstairs. I wondered whether he could be a doctor, but no, I thought he couldn't be a doctor or he would have a quieter and more persuasive manner. There was not much time to consider the subject, for we were soon in Miss Havisham's room where she and everything else were just as I'd left them. So the sort of most disturbing thing about this man really is the smell, because he's a burly, rather brutal character. He's got this smell of scented soap. Is he a doctor? What is he? And so there we go. The episode ends. And then 10 years later, one month later in the life of the novel, so uh, uh, five installments later, we meet him again. And Pitt this time is in the local with, with his, uh, with, with Joe Gargery, the blacksmith. He's in um, the Three Jolly Bargemen, the local inn. And this stranger arrives. You have an apprentice pursued the stranger, commonly known as Pip. Is he here? I am here, I cried. The stranger did not recognize me, but I recognized him as the gentleman I'd met on the stairs on the occasion of my second visit to Miss Havisham. I had known him the moment I saw him looking over the settle. And now that I stood confronting him with his hand upon my shoulder, I checked off again in detail his large head, his dark complexion, his deep set eyes, his bushy black eyebrows, his large watch chain, his strong black dots of beard and whisker, and even the smell of scented soap on his great hand. And so we're recognize we're encountering him again, and Pip is, and he finds out he's called Mr. Jaggers. He's the lawyer, he's the guy who tells Pip he's got great expectations and dispenses money to him. And then over another month later, Pip only a year older, he's in London and he visits Mr. Jaggers uh, at his, his, uh, his chambers. And he's a lawyer, he deals mostly with criminals. Um, sometimes he gets them off, sometimes they're hanged. And he, his premises are just next to Newgate Prison near Smithfield Meat Market. I embrace this opportunity of remarking that he washed his clients off as if he were a surgeon or a dentist. He had a closet in his room fitted up for the purpose, which smelt of the scented soap like a perfumer's shop. It had an unusually large jack towel on a roller inside the door, and he would wash his hands and wipe them and dry them all over this towel whenever he came in from a police court or dismissed a client from his room. And so he's like, he's kind of like Lady Macbeth, isn't he? Washing his clients off. And so when the smell activates the memory, as smells do, you know, how it is for all of us, you smell something and that's, that's more memory activating than almost anything else. So Dickens is using that. But also you can see when he was writing that early instalment, he already knew about this later one, which he hadn't written, <laughs> which hadn't happened. It just was existing in his imagination. He already, and, and it's just a little example of how he's making the necessity to connect across time, all the time it took to actually publish this novel in installments. But he's making that sort of part of the novel, really, the way things are connected across time and the way that the smell here, years later, suddenly we understand it, don't we? Well, it's funny because in in, uh, in so many uh, you know books about creative writing, you know you hear that they talk about the importance of employing you know all five sentence senses, and particularly smell. You know that that's uh, is that's that what, what I don't know? Is that yeah? That's a that's a that's a thing, is it? In creative absolutely. writing, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and lots of yeah. Well, things. I think anybody who wants to do that could learn. I mean, I've written, there's a chapter on, on smelling things in my, in my book because uh, I think you can learn so much from the way that Dickens does it. And, you know, people at the time, the, there was this man, I can't remember his name now, who was a, a kind of office clerk. He was a boy, really, working for Dickens on this, on this journal. And he 
years later as an old man in his 80s in the early 20th century he dictated his memories of Dickens and he says he remembered him going around London sniffing you know <laughs> like a kind of like a cocker spaniel or something yeah. you know that that smells were the smells were as distinctive as sight sounds everything else for him yeah you know what occurred to me also by by reading your book um is just how how modern he seems in so many different ways. Uh, I can picture him looking at his Amazon reviews uh, at, or looking at his Goodreads page. Uh, you make the point that this is really interesting, um, you know, how these, these uh, weekly, monthly serials came out. He was able to kind of gauge reader reaction by the sales figures. Uh, and that fascinated me because that's I thought, wow, that's very contemporary sounding. Yeah, and yeah. Did, did you find evidence that he, he uh, tweaked his material accordingly? Well, yes, there is evidence. I mean, absolutely there is. Um, in a way, his first big success is the best example of that, which is with the Pickwick Papers. Um, and that's he was looking at the sales. He's a very young man, you know, and he's writing the Pickwick papers. And, you know, it, about a, a third of the way through it, I, Fred, I fear I've forgotten which, which in, number installment it is. He brings in this character, Sam Weller, who the slightly unworldly um, and, you know, lovably foolish Mr. Pickwick meets in the courtyard of a coaching inn in London, in, off Borough High Street, Street where, where um, Sam Weller is cleaning everybody's boots. He's a, he's a boot shiner. And, and Sam Weller and Pickwick get kind of paired up. He employs Sam Weller, who gets him out of a scrape and then spends the rest of the novel getting him out of further scrapes. And as soon as Sam Weller came in, the sales just went whoosh. And Dickens, you know, all the evidences, Dickens had, he was just going to be another character Mr. Pickwick met. But as soon as Dickens saw that, Sam Weller became, if not the central character, but, you know, one of those servants who is, I mean, it's a, like Jeeves or something, you know. Yeah. It's a great comic tradition that the servant is always cleverer than the master. I mean, that's essential to all comedy. And, um, right. and, and Dickens saw saw that and immediately knew he was onto something and in some ways he never looked back because after Sam Weller came in Pickwick just sold massively and Dickens gave Dickens huge confidence that he sort of he could feel what people liked you know so um the, the, I mean the, the other side of it though Patrick is that Dickens's early novels, uh, you know, Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby, um, Barnaby Rudge to some extent, Martin Chuzzlewit, The Old Curiosity Shop. So that's the kind of first third of his career. He is planning them a bit, but he's also making stuff up as he goes along. And then you get to this, no the novel Dombey and Son, which is the one before uh, David Copperfield and he's so successful he can do what he wants and the, the booksellers will take it you know they'll agree to whatever he wants to do and that's the first novel I think which is where he's planned the whole thing and where he is therefore committed and he can't just change stuff yeah he can't just uh, so he cares a lot about how it's selling and he can adapt by putting in maybe a bit more, you know, and a little comic interlude to try and raise the spirits. But he can no longer do what he did with Pickwick and just follow the readership. He's decided what he's going to do. Um, and, and so and, and we know that because he left us um, his mems, as he called them, which are his plans for all his novels from Dombey and Son off after, onwards. And he left them to his friend, John Forster, who then left them to the Victoria and Albert Museum, basically. And I think he left them partly because, I mean, he knew that they were valuable, 
but he also wanted posterity to see that he was planning this stuff. He wasn't just making yeah. it up as he went along. Is that museum right by the Royal Albert Hall? Um, uh, it's not far from the Royal. Yeah, it's a bit south of there. There's an area where there's lots of museums, the Science Museum. It's next to the Natural History Museum, which is uh, perhaps the most famous one because it's a very beautiful Victorian Gothic building. And it's just the other side of the road. And inside the Victorian Albert Museum, there's something called the National Art Library, which has um, not all, but the great majority of Dickens's manuscripts to Dickens's novels. So there's one or two in the States, but they're mostly in the Victorian Albert Museum. And the amazing thing is you can, you know, you've got to arrange it, you've got to ask in advance, you've got to present your credentials, but you can go in and sit down and see him at it. I mean, it's like watching him do it. That would be just incredible. I'd love to do that. Yeah, well, yeah. you should. You should because Dickens' manuscripts are unlike any other literary manuscripts I've ever seen in that he doesn't make fair copies or second drafts, okay? So everything is the first draft. Everything that went, and that was what went to the printers. However, that makes him sound like he's just improvising all the time. But this when you look at the sections of your book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you talk well, about his his uh, meticulous self editing. And yes, uh, yeah. every sentence pretty much. So what he does is is and they're really difficult to read because his writing is very tiny. And he when he crosses something out, he inks it out so that it can't be read. You know, so the guys at the print shop can't make a mistake about what reading he means. I mean, he writes in changes in even tinier writing. And so you can get these, a lot of these manuscripts online, but however well pixelated your screen is, you, you won't be able to read them. And if you look at them in the flesh, you can sometimes make them out. And it's as if he sets off on a sentence. I mean, he changes his mind, changes his mind, changes his mind. But once he's nailed that sentence, then he's on to the next one. What he doesn't do is come back and rewrite a whole section or so it on the one hand, he's writing on the wing with this tremendous sense of speed and invention. But on the other hand, he's minutely editing and changing all the time. And it's completely wrong to think of him, you know, as a careless writer. He's a minutely careful one, but just not in the way that other writers are. Well, in that way, he seems very contemporary because I'm assuming that a lot of that was uh, dictated by the, the the demands of deadlines, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a story that Dickens himself told that he was writing, I can't remember which novel it is now, but he was writing uh, Little Dorrit or whatever it was in Broadstairs in Kent, where he used to go on summer holiday. Actually, it wasn't Little Dorrit, it was before for that because he was still with his wife at this time and he was on family holiday and he was writing this novel and he'd run out of paper and he was getting closer and closer to he started off sort of three months ahead of himself as it were but it was getting it went to two months and then it went just to one month and he he went to the stationers to buy some paper and he there was a lady in front of him in the queue and she was loudly demanding from the stationer the latest installment that he was still writing <laughs> yeah um let's see God, i got a bunch of there's so much to go over and um also everybody who's watching if you if you have questions uh please don't hesitate to put them in the comments field uh, and i'll be happy to ask them and i have a feeling we're going to run a little bit long today <laughs> i hope you don't mind john no no there's so much I'm in your hands. Too long, but there's so much, and I don't want to get in the way of some of the things that you wanted to discuss as well. Um, but uh, yeah, there was, where was I going to go next? Yeah, I wanted to, we, we can't neglect to talk about uh, the Artful Dodger and the importance of the Artful Dodger and, um, you know, how, he, how much Dickens admired sleight of hand. Yes. And, uh, you know, that whole notion of self-sufficiency that you write about. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, because the title of my book, which I have to confess, uh, somebody clever at the publishing company 
thought of it. And as soon as, and it's somebody I've never met. And as soon as, as it was suggested to me, I just thought, yes, yes, that, that is the title I want, The Artful Dickens, because um, it does echo The Artful Dodger. And there's a, there's a great episode in Oliver Twist, which sort of sums up the special qualities of that novel, actually, where Oliver has been taken into sort of Fagin's lair, Fagin's gang. And, in a, and essentially what they're trying to do is corrupt him, you would say, teach him how to be a thief. Um, and what happens is he watches as Fagin pretends to be a gentleman in the street in London with a handkerchief in his pocket. And handkerchiefs were quite valuable and easy to steal. And then uh, uh, two, two of um, uh, his kids, Master Bates and the Artful Dodger, practice stealing from him. And they have to do it without him feeling it. And, you know, one of them will bump into him while the other one does it. And they go through a great kind of pantomime of pretending this is really happening in the street. And Oliver watches, and at first he's sort of horrified because this is teaching you how to be a thief. But it's so entertaining. <laughs> but eventually he just finds himself roaring with laughter and clapping, you know. <laughs> and, and, um, and Oliver Twist is a bit like that after all, isn't it? You know, Fagin, who's officially the most de the demonic character and in some ways a very, a, an infamously anti-Semitic representation. But he's also the most entertaining character um, and the most amusing and the most theatrical. Um, and Dickens was, was theatrical. He was a performer. And um, I discovered, I, I didn't know. Sorry? You think he identified? Um, I, I, think, I think in a theatrical way, in that I think he thought of writing parts that he would enjoy reading, enjoy performing. I don't think, I think he identified just as much as now actors will say, oh, I really enjoy playing Iago. You know, or I <laughs> don't they? I really enjoy playing Edmund in King Lear. You know, I don't want to do Edgar. No, no, I want to be Edmund. Um, I don't, you know, uh, uh, and yeah. So I think in that sense, he, he, he wrote parts that he would like to inhabit. And I didn't know when I was writing the book, but I did, you know, I found out that he was not just later in his career, um, a noted performer of ap episodes from his own books, which he did as a sort of show, a road show, but actually he was also much earlier in his life. Um, he was a really accomplished amateur conjurer. And in the 1840s in London, magic shows became quite popular. Um, you know, sort of pen and teller stuff, stuff, you know, this is kind of, it became a thing on the London stage. And Dickens went to these shows and he was fascinated and he learned tricks himself. And there were shops you could go to in London to buy the stuff. And the, the historian Thomas Carlyle's wife, Jane, gives a really great account of going to a, an evening party and where Dickens did his favorite trick, which was he took a top hat and you would see on the cover, you kindly displayed, he's got a top hat on my cover. He took a top hat and into the hat, he put all the ingredients for a Christmas pudding. And then he would shake the hat and out of it produce a steaming Christmas pudding. It's a very kind of Dickensian trick, isn't it? And that was his sort of coup de théâtre. And, and it seems to me in a way that's a kind of, that epitomizes what Dickens was like, yeah. a sort of trickster performer. And where you were, you were supposed to be delighted by the flourish of ingenuity. Did he invent that, that convention in magic with the hat or was that something? No, I don't think he invented it. I don't think he invented it, but um, I think it was quite, it was a trick that was already established to put stuff into a hat and produce. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I don't know if the Christmas pudding aspect of it was not, I think that might've been something that he invented. But it should be a Christmas pudding that came out of the hat. Wow. 
I mean, what more Dickensian thing could you have than a steaming Christmas pudding? Well, it's funny you mentioned Dickensian because uh, what I what would it be too easy to say that perhaps the critics kind of snubbed him or didn't really recognize how wildly inventive he was because he was uh, kind of a, a writer of the people. He was the people's writer. And yeah. uh, he, went, he went down into the dark streets of London and wrote about very serious things that, uh, you know, people from the lower classes were, you know, dealt with. Yeah, I do. No, I absolutely think that. And I think that um, I, I don't think it was always just the subject matter, although it sometimes was that. Um, I think it was. How can I put it? I think it was the mixture of the, the serious and the absurd. So it was, it, I think he could be forgiven by many of his more high-minded contemporaries for writing about uh, crime and disease and social ills, because other novelists did that. That was, you know, that was something the novel might be expected to do. Um, you know, Anthony Trollope wrote a novel called, a good novel, really good novel called The Way We Live Now. And that was one thing. Mm -hmm novels New were supposed to, yeah, supposed to address. But what Dickens did, which was, I think, singular, was so often he mingled the serious and the absurd. So if, if, if any of, any of the, our listeners want, want a sample, just, just look at the first chapter of Dombey and Son, okay? And it's, it's about... In a way, it's a Victorian deathbed scene. Mrs. Dombey has just given birth to a baby, but she's dying. Mr. Dombey, who's this hard-hearted business tycoon, um, who's unable to unbend even as his wife dies. He's only, even then unable to kind of express affection because actually a part of him is triumphant because he's got a son, Dombey and son. And previously, all he's had is a daughter, and the daughter is in the chapter, and she's absolutely distraught because her mother's dying. And all he can think about is his company, really. And, you, you know, it's a kind of classic Victorian thing, you might say. Do you have that handy? I don't have it handy, I'm afraid. But I, I, it just it's only just occurred to me, I'm afraid, as an example. Because the great thing about it is, <laughs> the Dickensian thing is, in amongst all this sentiment and tragedy and the mingled kind of critique of commercial avarice, um, there are these doctors and nurses. And <laughs> the, the doctors, the two doctors and the nurse have been hired by Mr. Dombey. And because he's really rich, he's hired the most expensive doctors, you know. And they are used to only attending upon the aristocracy. And so the doctor, the Harley Street doctor, keeps getting Mrs. Dombey's name wrong because he keeps calling her the Countess of Dombey and Lady <laughs> Dombey and, and, and correcting himself. And the nurse is so terrified by Mr. Dombey and his wealth but she can't remember anything. And so even when, when she's asked her name, she even gives the, her name as a question, as if she wants to say, anyway, these blundering idiots are kind of hilarious. And it's so characteristic of Dickens that, and, and just the kind of thing that struck many contemporaries or contemporary critics as, you know, now you'd say inappropriate, that he often makes you laugh when you shouldn't laugh. You know, he often, some of the funniest moments are funny because you're not supposed to laugh at that. Right. And, and the novel we've talked about most, Great Expectations, seems to me a, a, a work of absolute genius because so often it's funny as well as frightening and, and or horrifying. Yeah. Um, and Bleak House equally is like that. So he does take you down into the dark streets and you see bad things, but you can bet your bottom dollar just at the moment when you're all sort of 
rigid with your bracing yourself for some terrible bit of social realism you'll get some kind of absolutely absurd eccentric strolling in and you know, doing a kind of comic turn it makes me think you know i wonder if uh, monty python uh you know were influenced by dickens because <laughs> they do the same thing in a lot of in a lot of cases yeah yeah um well there's so much to talk about in, in the book um i do have a question from one of our viewers which is uh which is good. Uh, Laura says, how long would a, a monthly serial usually be? And how long would a weekly serial be? Okay. Gosh, well, that's, that, that's a good question. So a monthly serial, um, the monthly serial is easier to answer because he had one standard way of doing it, which he'd discovered for himself and he only varied it once. So a monthly serial was always 20 parts. But the last two parts came together because if you can imagine, you know, you notice this in TV serials, it's quite sure. difficult to tie everything up at the end. Special yeah? two hour, special two hour conclusion. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so you might say it was 19 parts with the last one being a double part. So there were 18 gaps. Yeah. And the only exception to that, so that's all the great big thick Dickens novels, right, um, uh, are, are like that. And um, so that's David Copperfield, Bleak House, Martin Chuzzlewit, Our Mutual Friend. Um, I think, I can't remember how many, but more than half of his novels are like that. And the only um, exception to it is, um, uh, his last novel, um, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which he, he was trying out something new. So that was um, going to be 12 parts. And uh, he died, but he died halfway through. So exactly halfway through, um, it ends. And <laughs> so it really is a mystery. And um, uh, you know, we spend a, people spent a lot of time trying to fill in what was going to happen because he clearly it's about a murder, or we don't even know if the guy is murdered actually, um, but a probable murder. And it's really clear that Dickens had found out exactly, worked out exactly what was going to happen, and that he planted the clues to the whole mystery in the bit he did finish, but you know, he didn't finish it, he died. So that was, that was the, a new form for the monthly one. The, the weekly ones, they varied a bit. Um, so the shortest is hard time. And the weekly ones all appeared in a journal or magazine, right? Uh, so the, whereas the monthly installments are, are, are on their own, in, in, as I described it, like a little paperback book. So like a the, digest sized. Yes. Yeah. And then at the end, if you bought them in that form, you could get them all bound up um, if you wanted. So um, interestingly, comic books or it is, they call them graphic novels. Sorry to interrupt. Um, no, that's fine. They follow that same convention now. You know, they, okay. they will release the individual volumes. And then if you like, there is a, a large trade paperback which collects okay. them all. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So and then the weekly ones, um, which appeared in in what I guess we would call magazines, um, which they often call journals. Most of them were ones which Dickens himself edited, or as he put it, conducted. And those varied in length. So the shortest was hard times. So that's published weekly. And I think, how long? That took about four and a half months um, to, to, to get from beginning to end. Um, great Expectations, is that seven months, something like that? I'm, I'm guessing, I'm trying to remember. So Laura's caught me out slightly. But I know Hard Times was, I'm sure, for about, was just under five months was in weekly install. Was Bleak House his longest book? Ooh, his longest. Well, I think you see those 20-part monthly serials 
were almost exactly this almost all exactly the same length wow um um i don't think bleak house is his longest actually i think that little dorrit might be a bit longer than that hmm. but that's a good question i mean the difference in length amongst those uh monthly serials is quite small you know so they're very they're very similar lengths to each other that's funny i know uh you know writers like george simenon you know when he wrote his mcgray novels yes you know, they were exactly this you know a particular amount no more no less he was done yeah 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 well <laughs> yeah that's i mean dickens had a certain space to fill um and very very occasionally it went wrong and while he was still sort of and there's a great bit um uh there's a bit in D david copperfield where he hadn't he'd underwritten and the the printers went back to him and said oh no you haven't filled up the right number of pages and so he had to write some extra paragraphs and he wrote these brilliant extra paragraphs, some of the best paragraphs he'd written, all about little Emily almost drowning and might it have been better if she had drowned and what a terrible thought. Why am I saying this? Oh, no, I shouldn't say this now. I should have said it later on in the story, but let it stand. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you find um, in the course of, you know, I'm sure rereading a lot of his books um, that his inventiveness uh, over time he became more and more inventive or did it change over time? Um, I think that, yeah, did he become more and more inventive? I think that he could pay less attention. He paid less attention to the business of pleasing people perhaps. So um, he became more confident that he could take his readers with him, whatever he did. Um, but no, I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, Bleak House, which is right, Bleak House is right in the middle of his career. And it's as or formally audacious a novel as, as you'll ever find. I think it is the case that I think people often think of his last novels. Um, you know, A Tale of a Two Cities, Our Mutual Friend. Well, it's Little Dorrit, Our Mutual Friend, The Mystery of Edwin Drood as, as darker, you know. And they, they're often the ones that academics like writing about most. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> because they, the academics also find it difficult, the ones which are funny. It's, you know, the, the funnier it is, the harder it is for us literary critics to write about. So... There's a certain, certainly they get, they get darker, I would say. But I, I, I think that, no, he tries different experiments. He doesn't become more experimental. I've had a couple of interesting questions come in here. Um, Elizabeth, uh, she writes, did Dickens ever make any significant amendments to the text as serialized for publication in novel form? Okay, so... No, he didn't. He didn't do that. However, he did have changes of mind in the course of publishing. Um, and changed his mind about things that he had embarked on. So, um, uh, so he didn't go and rewrite the novels in order to make them into books. He tended to go on to his next, you know, his next project. Although he always planned, you know, as soon as the serial was near the end in its either monthly or weekly form, he had the book ready to come out, you know, to get more sales, to capitalize on that. And then after that, a cheap one volume book for people who couldn't afford the sort of, you know, the, the, uh, the posh version. Um, but he did do things, I don't know, you know, that he did do things like he famously changed the ending of Great Expectations. I don't know if, if people know about this, but from in between 
actually first writing it and it being published because uh, one of his friends, the novelist Bulwer Lytton, said he wrote he wrote a version which had an unhappy ending, and it's a brilliant unhappy ending, in my opinion, where a, where Pip meets Estella years later in the street in London. She's in a carriage and her, her first husband, the brutish Bentley Drummle has died. He's kicked to death by a horse that he's mistreating. And she's married again, a Shropshire doctor. So she's not available and Pip meets her and Pip has got with him the child of Joe Gargery and Biddy, Biddy whom he could have married if he hadn't been such a fool. <laughs> but she she married Joe instead and they had a son and they named their son Pip so he's with little Pip in the street and he meets Estella and Estella says to him you know hold that child up to me and he holds the child up and Estella assumes that the child is Pip's child and so he, she assumes that he's had a happy ending he's got a wife he's got a family and he does not correct her mistake. So they set, they part on a misapprehension. And that was the original ending. And Bulwer Lytton said, no, you can't, you can't do this. So instead he wrote the ending, which we now all read, and which is still slightly ambiguous actually, but where he meets Estella again in the grounds of Satis House. And she is, she's a free woman because her first husband has, died, has been killed and she hasn't married again. And, and Pip says, I saw no shadow of a further future parting from her. So he changed, his, he changed it. But when he changed things, he changed them, you know, at that pre-publication stage. And once it was published, it was there, it was gone. Um, I'm, I'm glad I remembered this. My wife asked me, because my wife is a big uh, devotee of Edgar Allan Poe, and... Um, uh, has some sort of distant uh, relationship to that to that family. I don't know. Really? Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she was there some sort of connection between the two. Uh, Dickens was supportive of Poe, isn't that right? Yes. And and Dickens Dickens did um, sort of uh, two American tours, as it were. Um, and 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 on the earlier one, he met Poe, who oh, really? who. Yeah, he met Poe, and there was they they were great admirers of each other's writing. Yeah, and um, it, it's likely actually that although that Poe's famous poem, "The Raven," has a Dickens connection, because do you, I, I mean I don't know you do you know that poem, Patrick? Famous poem, of course. Yeah. Poe's famous poem, "The Raven." Well, Dickens, I mean. It's all Poe's, but one of the things that fascinated Poe that Dickens told him was, um, I think Poe had read Barnaby Rudge, which has a, a talking raven in it, um, called Grip. And uh, Grip's quite a big character in the novel. And Dickens said, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's the one not character in, in all my fiction who's not invented. Grip is my raven. I have a raven called Grip. He said, or rather, I had a raven called Grip and he died and he was my greatest friend. And when he died, I had him stuffed and put in a glass case above my desk so I can look at him every day. And he says, I've got another raven who's also called Grip, who's a new raven, but he's, he's not a patch on the old Grip. And, <laughs> and apparently Poe was really um, taken with this story. And it seems likely that it sort of generated the raven in the famous poem. I'll be darned. That's a wonderful story. I, I did good, not know it? that. Well, it seems like there is, there's a little bit of, a, of an analog there between the two of them, because if you read, you know, I went back and reread some of the Poe stories, and a lot of that stuff is just wildly inventive and ahead of yeah. its time. And... Um, you know, it's interesting to go back and read it from a modern perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's still, I, I mean, I'm sure, I'm no expert on the relationship, but it seems, I'm sure that there's more to it than has actually been written about. Because, of course, 
you know, Poe is an incredible sort of inventor of things and is in some ways, you know, the great progenitor of the detective story. Yeah. And Dickens was fascinated by detective stories and was the first in Bleak House, the first English novelist to have a detective. Mm. Um, and and, and as, as you might know, Dickens actually would go out at night with the detective force in London. You know, I did not know that. Oh yeah, 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 and and he represent and wrote articles about them, journalistic articles, in which he represented the cleverer ones anyway as these great cerebral people who had, you know, a greater knowledge of human nature than anyone else in London. Well, then, um, and then comes uh, Conan Doyle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Conan Doyle. You know, uh, the the Inspector Bucket in Bleak House is a sort of predecessor of Sherlock Holmes in that he's already developing those things that the detective has, that, that weird, weird gift of insight into human beings that makes them sort of scary, slightly monstrous figures. But, you know, they always know, they always get it right. Right, and then um, I don't know if you've come across that uh, novel by Dan Simmons called Drood. Which oh, is, no, I haven't. What's that? Oh, it's fantastic. Big, thick novel. Um, and Dan Simmons, by the way, is, is a really, really terrific uh, writer. Um, but Drood is, is obviously about Dickens's death and, uh, and the process of writing The Mystery of Edwin Drood. But it's told from the perspective of Wilkie Collins. <laughs> and Collins, I guess, it's funny, uh, just but what we're talking about um, with commercial fiction versus, you know, quote, literary fiction. And Collins in this book considers himself Salieri to uh, Dickens's Mozart, you know, almost. Yes. Uh, yeah. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful book, you know, and of course yes. it speculates that Dickens is murdered and. Right. What kind of, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yes. Well, I um, think that Dick, I think, I think I have to say, I think Collins, I think Salieri Mozart, I think, Collins, Collins knew Dickens was a sort of greater writer, but at the same time, I mean, Dickens learned a lot from Collins, and it was a, it wasn't, it wasn't one way that relationship. Yeah, perhaps I have it reversed. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe Dickens was Salieri. Oh right, I can't recall. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I guess it would work either way, wouldn't it? Um, let's see. Linda has a question: uh, Is there any truth to the myth that Dickens was paid by the word? Um, no, he wasn't paid by the word, um, but he did, a, he did, he did, as it were, a new deal every time, you know, and, um, he, had a good he was, agent. sorry, he had a good agent. He was his own agent. <laughs> I mean, his friend Forster sometimes helped him negotiate, but no, Dickens was his own agent and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he did a new deal every time and the deals got better and better, generally speaking, through his career. And, um, you know, the deal, uh, it, there's a wonderful book called Dickens and His Publishers by a guy called Robert Patton, P-A-T-T-E-N, which goes into min minute and fascinating detail. And, and you know, like a good agent would do on the writer's behalf now, but Dickens did it for himself, his deals would specify not just how much he was going to get for, say, writing um, a 20-part serial novel, but also how much he was going to get for the three-volume book version, how much he was going to get for the one-volume cheap reprint, how much he was going to get for any versions made to be sold at railway stations how much you know right. um complicated deals so not exactly you know not by the word but um uh he definitely you know he wrote for money he absolutely wrote for money but there are not many novelists who don't care about money at all he's just right more efficient than most in you know, monetizing the very the different ways in which his novels, you know, could appear. And, and you should also realize, you know, 
uh, two things, which is, first of all, that he came from a background where the fear of penury was very real, and therefore his ability to make a lot of money, a lot, quite a lot of which he then had to hand back to his feckless father and his hopeless brothers, and then in time, his feckless children. Um, <laughs> the ability to make money was bred, the desire to make money was bred into him by the, the circumstances in which he grew up. But also I think um, the amount of money he made was a sort of measure of his, of his appeal to his readers throughout the world. Mm. So it wasn't just, he wasn't, I mean, you know, he liked to earn money, he liked to spend money, but I think also it was another measure of his vibrancy in the, uh, in, as he thought it, in the, in, in the lives of his readers who were prepared actually to pay to read him. You know, I mean, Shakespeare was a hugely commercial, successful commercial writer and all the evidence is, but he went to considerable lengths to maximize his earning potential. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's absolutely reconcilable with the highest creative abilities. <laughs> Yeah, that, I was going to ask you, there's a great, great quote somewhere in the book where you say uh, popularity and literary ambition were twinned in Dickens. Yeah, I think that's, that's what you've been I, talking about. I think that's right. You know, yeah. that, that um, you know, just in some of the little samples, the little passages that we looked at earlier, um, you know, he's in some ways, he's using aspects of the English language, for instance, which are alive still in the ways we talk to each other, but perhaps also sometimes alive in Dickens's day on the popular stage or in the popular press, but which were not alive in good literature. And he, he tapped into those, you know, repetitions, cliches, yes. extraordinary flights of fancies, ghosts, you know, all right. the kind of things which um, you might say don't, don't normally belong in high literary works, he brought in. Um, so popularity, you know, was really essential to the way he wrote. Well, I want to just, I know we're, we're kind of going all over the place, but I'm having such a wonderful time talking with you. And I hope the readers are having fun too. They seem to be. Uh, let's see just to give people a taste of what you can expect in this book, maybe we can just go briefly through, you just mentioned a couple of the chapters, but um, here they are. Uh, some of the things that he wrote about, fantasizing, smelling, uh, changing tenses, which we've talked about a little, a little bit. But I wanted to ask, did he ever employ the second person, which is very rare? No, no, no. he didn't, no. Okay. I mean, that is very rare. Yeah, those things, what is it? Um, Jay McInerney, Bright Lights, Big City. I think that's all in the second person. That's a I think novel of a I could, couple of them. Yeah, are there, there are other one or two others, but there no, are a few. that would be hard to sustain. I would think. Yes. Um, yes. There was a book, a, a really slim. It's funny you mentioned Muriel Spark earlier, who I really love, and who is finally starting to get a little resurgence of interest. But there's this real bizarre Scottish writer named Ron Butlin who wrote a book called The Sound of My Voice. Uh, and I believe the entire thing is in second person. Right, it's, okay. It's one of the most devastating books about alcoholism I've ever read. Anyway, okay. I digress. Um, changing tenses, haunting, laughing, um, naming, which will go back, let's bookmark that. I wanna ask you about that, of course. Um, using coincidences, exposing, or excuse me, enjoying cliches, um, speaking, foreseeing, uh, drowning, knowing about sex, um, and then finally just breaking the rules. Yeah. But naming is so important with Dickens. Um, we, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about that for a few minutes. Okay, fine. Yeah. Names. Yeah. yeah names are really, really important to him. And I mentioned earlier these notes, these memes he left of his plans 
for his novels. And quite often when he's beginning thinking about a novel, what you find him doing is beginning thinking about the names of the main characters and maybe even just the name of the main character. As if once he's got the name, he's in. And I just, I've actually got it from my, I'm afraid I haven't got it as a slide, but I've got it in my book. I'll just read you. It's not very short. What you get on the um, first notes for David Copperfield, right? And he writes out, the first thing he does, he writes out some columns of names. And the first columns goes like this. Trotfield, Trotbury, Spankle, Wellbury, Copperboy, Flowerbury, Topflower, Magbury, Copperstone, Copperfield, Copperfield. <laughs> and the Copperfield's the only one he writes twice. And once he's got it, he writes it twice and he's got it. And, and you can see what he's thinking about because actually in those names he tries out, that he doesn't use, Trotbury, Trotbury, Flowerbury, Topflower. There's this thing, I don't know if, if, you, if you remember it, but there's this thing in uh, David Copperfield that um, uh, Steerforth, the sort of diabolical friend who actually brings tragedy and destruction in his wake, but who David thinks is wonderful, calls David Daisy because he's so innocent hmm. and in a way and it, it's half affectionate but half nasty because he's so innocent that he can't see what's happening which is that Steerforth is seducing Emily oh and he's he's going to get her to elope with him and it's happening in front of David he can't see it because he's too much of a of a daisy you know, and and you can hear that Dickens is thinking about that, isn't he? Top flower, flowerbury, copper boy. Um, and in fact, he thinks about it a lot because and Trotfield and Trotbury and and um, uh, David's uh, uh, aunt, Betsy Trotwood, um, uh, wanted wanted him to be a girl, didn't she? And so, and, and so she refuses to call him David. She calls him Trot. And, and actually, all through the novel, everybody calls David something apart from David. Everybody calls him something else. And he's a bit of a plaything for people's projections, you might say. Interesting. And um, I re you remember there's that wonderful bit early on where Mr. Murdstone, who David doesn't quite realise is courting David's mother. He's going to marry her. But she's a beautiful young widow. And she is, he's a predator, really. And he go takes David out for a day by the sea with these louche friends of his who lie around smoking all the time. And they say things to him like, how's the young widow? And... Murdstone talks to them in front of the boy in such a way that the boy won't realize what's going on. And he calls, he says, be careful of Brooks of Sheffield. He's sharp. And Brooks of Sheffield is David, but David doesn't realize. And they're talking and they, they get David drunk. He's only a little boy. And they're all toasting Brooks of Sheffield, <laughs> which is... And again, it's, it's actually a mocking name. And you realise that all this stuff about names, it runs really deep into the novel. So that when Dickens was thinking about the names, he was thinking hard about every aspect of his protagonist, actually. Well, it seems like Dickens would have, would have loved uh, Cockney rhyming slang. Well, Dickens loved all slang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... and uh, he loved, I mean, he loved the way, it's great, isn't it? The way his names don't, they don't sort of directly tell you what somebody is like. Right. But they are a kind of poetry, aren't they? I mean, Murdstone, we've mentioned, is quite close to telling you Murdstone. Um, 
what he's like. And um, actually, Betsy Trotwood later says in the novel, that awful man whose name is like murder. <laughs> and he is a murderer. He actually kills, in a sense, he kills David with cruelty. And how, how is Murdstone spelled? Is it M? E-R-D? M-U-R-D-S-T-O-N-E, uh, Murdstone. Um, uh, but they're great, aren't they? I mean, the, you know, the famous ones. It's difficult. It's difficult now to believe that Dickens invented the name Scrooge. I mean, he, mm. you know, it's not a word. He invented it. Scro right. I mean, it became a word. <laughs> well, chuzzle, um, chuzzle wit is a great one. Chuzzle wit, yes. Um, I mean, Scrooge is brilliant because... It's as soon as you hear it, it's an incarnation of what that character is. And you can try and unpack it and say, oh, it's screw and gouge. And is it? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is all those things. Um, but he had a special. It conjures delight. up. A, yeah, Sorry? it conjures up a feeling of, you know, being kind of, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, it, it's as I said, it was an early sentence about him. It says, um, where the narrator says, oh, but he was a tight hand at the grindstone, old Scrooge. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, um, it's a cliche, isn't it? Put to new use, the grindstone. But yeah, the names. Um, and he kept a book of names and, um, uh, and collected them and tried them out. And... They're amongst his most sort of wonderful invention, really. Um, so I believe I'm right in saying there are more eponyms. That means words derived from names invented by Dickens um, in the Oxford English Dictionary than invented by any other writer. Um, so, um, you know, uh, within within a few months of Pickwick papers coming out, the word Pickwickian existed. <laughs> um, um, uh, as soon as our mutual friend started appearing, people started talking about pod snappery. Um, so he was brilliant, at, wasn't he, at inventing a character who seemed to embody certain recognizable human characteristics and give them a name, and the name became the qualities. Well, he also had uh, certain alter egos throughout the books too, did he not? I mean, uh, Copperfield would have been a, an alter ego of a sort, wouldn't he? Yes, I think so. I mean, David Copperfield is the story of somebody who becomes a novelist, who, who makes his way in life by, and before that, he's a novelist, he, he's a parliamentary reporter, as Dickens himself mm. was. Right. Um, and he also encounters in the novel his sort of, what, would-be guardian in a way, Mr. Micawber. Um, now, there's another great name, um, who is modeled quite closely on Dickens' father. Um, endlessly feckless, but endlessly verbose, and yet somehow buoyant, completely unputdownable. Um, if I may express myself Shakespeareanly, he says, <laughs> <laughs> using a word that's never been used in English before. And that is Dickens's dad, who was able to cover up for his hopeless fecklessness with at least being able to produce florid quotations from Macbeth whenever he felt like it. <laughs> Well, this has been a really wonderful conversation, um, Mr. Mullen or Dr. Mullen, Professor Mullen. John, you can call me John, John. Patrick. You've earned yeah. the right. <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And uh, um, your next pro do you have a, a next project in mind? Are you going to write oh, about Oh, that's Dick a good question. No, I don't, I'm, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, well, that would be good. That would be good. I'm resting on my laurels, I think, a bit at the moment. Yeah, not resting on my laurels. I'm waving my laurels around. <laughs> um, um, no, I'm, I, I don't know quite what my next project is um, at the moment. I'm, I'm, I've got some ideas, but they're, 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 I'm not going to bring them out into the light yet. But now, are, um, you still, are you still teaching? Or... Oh, yes. And, and actually, this has been a blissful 
diversion for me today because I spent the whole of the rest of the day actually not teaching but marking exams, grading exams. So, what classes are you teaching right now? Well, the, the actual teaching has stopped because the students have been doing the exams. But um, so I've been teaching. I've been teaching Victorian literature actually, even a little bit of Dickens and some Wilkie wow. Collins and George Eliot and stuff like that. Have you come across George? Is it George Gissing or just? I have. I have come yeah. across Gissing indeed. Yeah, I haven't. I've only read two or three of his novels. They're quite. Um, I mean, New Grub Street. I've read several times, which is yeah. wonderful. I mean, I would. You know, the thing about Gissing is, I think you need to space them out because they are very depressing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've only read New Grub Street, but uh, oh, it's yeah. I thought it was kind of neglected. You know, I think. Uh, well, of course, it was neglected in his own day because um, he he was boycotted by Moody's Circulating Library, who were the most important purveyors of fiction in Britain, because Moody, uh, the man who ran it, said Gissing was immoral. And so that really, really affected his sales badly. But I think New Grub Street is quite still is now quite well, quite you know, my students read it. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, here is the book, The Artful Dickens. Um, everybody should go read it. it. It would be, you know, it's funny, the audience for this book is so wide. When I was reading, I was thinking writers would do well to read this. There's a lot about the technical aspects of writing. Just book lovers would enjoy reading this. Um, so everybody, buy two copies, <laughs> one of your friends. You're very kind, Patrick. The best yeah. thing about it is it's got lots of Dickens in it. And it's a beautifully, beautifully produced book. It's nice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And so uh, hopefully it was the intern at the publishers who suggested the title. Uh, yeah. I don't think it was an intern, I'm afraid. It was somebody who's quite sort of um, been at the company quite a long time. Ah. But it was somebody who's on the commercial rather than the editing bit, you know, yeah. and has him, had himself a Dickensian nose for what would sell books well it's probably getting to be your bedtime so yeah I, yeah i'm gonna have to gonna have to go and have my supper actually patrick oh sorry yeah. to keep you so long no no it's great it's great it's, you've indulged been me yeah it's been a treat have, for me thank you have a wonderful night and um, okay. thanks everybody for watching on facebook and we will see you soon great thanks patrick i hope we meet one day that would be wonderful Bye. cheers Bye.